Good afternoon, Sun Dancers. Welcome to the Canon Creative Studio here at the Sundance Film Festival for the Behind the Lens series in partnership with American Cinematographer Magazine. My name is Jay Molden. I'm a director and producer in Los Angeles. I'm also an associate member of the ASC, and I'm a contributing technical editor for American Cinematographer Magazine. And it's my honor to host this panel with these two extraordinary filmmakers of a film called In a Violence in Nature. And boy, is it. I have a uh, cinematographer, Mr. Pierce Dirks, right next to me, and director, Mr. Chris Nash. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Ooh, thanks for having us. Okay, now the hard part's out of the way. Uh, Chris, tell us a little bit about this film. Uh, well, it's a, a different take on a slasher, like a traditional slasher film, like a Friday the 13th or a Burning or My Blake Valentine. Um, where instead of following around like the campers or you know the cannon fodder that would appear in a slasher, we're actually following the slasher around um, through the entire film, uh, treating it somewhat uh, met methodical, almost like you're just following a mailman as they go about their day of work, uh, just dispatching of campers uh, <laughs> throughout the day. Uh, it was. Uh, Heavily inspired by um, a lot of the more like deliberate and kind of slow cinema that's been appearing over the last couple of decades, uh, specifically like Gus Van Sant's trilogy of films of like, Jerry and Elephant in the Last Days, and um, some of the more experimental genre movies such as like Angst, um, Alan Clark's Elephants, uh, just films like that. Basically, it's taking that slasher character, that lumbering, slow-moving monster in the forest, and you're just with them the whole time. All the campers are kind of in the background. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that, um, I mean, one of the rules that we tried to follow when making this film is to try to have our slasher appear in every frame up until he does it. Um, or at least, like, if we have to start with him in frame, then like, drift to something else if needed. But, yeah, it's just trying to keep the film with John. Yeah, yeah, just to make it, like, the slasher's movie. Um, you know, jokingly treating it like we're shooting a nature documentary, where we're just going around, filming a giant lumbering monster man. You set the tone so beautifully in that opening shot. You're opening on a branch and holding on the branch, and there's just some dialogue happening in the background. Uh, it, it was absolutely the moment of, what the fuck? <laughs> And then you just slowly pan over to sort of the MacGuffin of the film, and you set that tone so great. You're like, okay, I'm in for a ride. Uh, this is going to be an experience. And it's such a unique and original take that I've never seen on the slasher genre. Uh, and I hope that all of the reception so far is going to be as deserved as it's that was a horrible way to say that. I hope you guys get all the justice serves in, in the reception you get from this because it. Well, thank you. Yeah, a, thanks, a I guess. Way. And thank you very much for coming. That, that's. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, okay, now that I fumbled that football. Um, you have a, a kind of a unique path on this film. You want to talk about the, sort of the switching of, of roles and how that came about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I've, I've known Nash and like creative team behind this project for quite some time. Like, how long? Like, 14, 15 years, maybe? Yeah, at least 15. Yeah, so we, we've always collaborated on different things, sometimes as a... Uh, can you guys hear me better now? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, uh, we've, we've always worked together on different projects. Sometimes Nash is doing effects. Sometimes like I'm shooting for someone else. Sometimes I'm working with him as a DP. Sometimes it's the uh, DP-director relationship. But uh, for this project, I got involved quite early on. There was a different uh, cinematographer attached. And uh, yeah, Nash, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, very sort of like original block of filming? Yeah, sure. So uh, we actually um, shot this, kind of shot this movie twice. We uh, had one block of shooting. Uh, we shot in a completely separate area of Ontario, Canada. Um, we had um, a different DP attached, uh, our friend uh, Andrew Pell, who uh, is an excellent DP and director, um, and just a great guy in general. But um, during that uh, block of shooting, we shot for four weeks, probably about 60, 70% of the film. Um, we just had a lot of, you know, being a low budget indie, you're gonna have problems 
But this just seemed to be like an unprecedented amount of problems, whether it be uh, weather or illness or, I, I, it's really, my trauma is just gonna be released. <laughs> but uh, when we were done and we, were, uh, we did an assembly of the footage that we had, and it just, it didn't feel right. It's just like we weren't quite hitting the note. Our Monster Man didn't look as good as we thought it should. Um, we had a, a, an issue where we actually, um, our main character, the guy playing the monster himself, uh, had a sudden illness and had to be replaced. So with our main character being replaced, we were thinking like, okay, he's in a costume, it's gonna be okay, but the physicality of the performance was just too different. Um, even though every replacement just gave a great job. So we uh, made the decision to uh, essentially reshoot the film using what remained of our budget um, after essentially shooting principal photography. So it was a, a, we had to go completely strip down, strip down the crew. Um, luckily, we didn't have to like incur some expenses because, uh, for instance, like the cast, uh, any of the death scenes or any of the prosthetics that we had to build, uh, we already had built, so we can like recycle those. Um, but unfortunately, one of the things that happened was uh, our uh, original DP, uh, his day job was shooting um, uh, what, Dark Side of the Ring for Vice, and then they offered him a uh, position directing the next couple of seasons, so it was something he couldn't pass up, and you know, we were all very, very happy for him. But Pierce, during the original world block, was shooting all the BTS, um, documenting all the issues that happened. Uh, so he was, and since we'd worked with him before, he was so familiar with like what we were doing and what we were trying to achieve uh, that when we had to replace Andrew, he stepped in and uh, just did an excellent job. It was it was no slight to uh, Andrew's work either, but whoa, there we go. Oh uh, yeah, it was no slight to Andrew's work. He did a phenomenal job, but also wasn't trying to uh, replicate any of his style or shots, it was just, it was like reapproaching the film from the ground up basically, and being just looking at everything from a completely fresh perspective before we went back to uh, continue uh, photography. I cannot fathom making that decision, being 60% uh, into an independent film and deciding, uh, okay, we're gonna reshoot it all. Talk about that process a little bit. Um, it was, uh, I mean, it wasn't a difficult decision to make because it's such a flippant thing to say that we're just gonna reshoot the movie. Uh, and then I just left it to my producers, just like, figure that out, guys. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, no, one, one of the things that, like, we just had to make some decisions. We, uh, one of the things that we did experience was um, that uh, due to the nature of the film itself, you know, we're shooting in remote locations, we're having to lug in all this equipment, uh, we'd have to, uh, Pierce can talk about this in detail later, but had to you know, get a different, more manageable camera package, um, whittle down the crew uh, pretty, con like, pretty excessively. And then um, uh, one of the other big decisions was like, that helped us out was, let's shoot in my hometown. Uh, because I kind of wrote it, like we're the area of Northern Ontario that I grew up in mind. Uh, let's just shoot there. I'll call in every favor from every family member and friend that I have and uh, just try to get it done that way. And uh, that, that original block was invaluable too because it, it let us know what wasn't working. It let us know what was, but more importantly, what wasn't working so we were able to like, re-approach things, re-figure it out. And it also wasn't for nothing because we still ended up with one shot from that block in the film. Yeah, one shot. <laughs> the most expensive shot in the entire movie is an over-the-shoulder shot uh, looking at another character. But it cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> so we're keeping that shot, I got you. Uh, started with another manufacturer's camera, uh, which we can actually talk about here, um, in that first block, but then you switched from the Aerial Alexa, which is what was used originally, to the C70. Uh, so, I mean, since, hey, we're here at Canon, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it was uh, being on set, you could just tell that having a camera of that size, even though the Alexa Mini is still small, it's one of those things like once you try to add stabilizers, 
and all the equipment that goes with it. Like we had an entire camera van of uh, equipment that we're having to try to load out to these locations. And like the camera crew was like trying to like roll all these cards out and just, it wasn't working. It was like, it was eating up so much time. It was killing the crew to try to like make a traditional package work for a non-traditional film at a non-traditional location. So when we uh, were looking at ways to um, kind of pick up photography again and kind of go- revisit all these sequences, the main thing was like, Sorry. this better? There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, it was just looking at uh, like a camera that would fit our needs. So we did a lot of research. I looked into a, a ton of different uh, uh, camera options and the C70 kind of merged as this uh, little sort of like perfect balance of uh, form and function. It was just like being able to have a camera that, because I was working with the uh, operator as well, just having a camera that was that small, had like a fantastic battery life, we could really strip it down and just go out to the woods with like one backpack of camera gear and like very sort of minimal support in this sort of Frankenstein stabilizer ring. And we could go out and kind of rig up the camera any way we needed to. We could, uh, yeah, just shoot for hours and just not have to worry about like running out of batteries or running out of media or all these other different things attached to it that could break and go wrong. Yeah, so the, the C70 was just the perfect fit of not compromising on the image and still giving us the quality that we want, but just having the practicality of being able to do what we wanted to do and not having to worry about like just trying to, you know, make a, a square peg fitting a round hole. It just, it, it, it worked for the film and the environment. Yeah, and I didn't make it easy on Pierce either, as far as like, um, you know, we're shooting in remote location because for some reason it, it says set in the middle of the woods, miles and miles away from civilization. I'm like, we should probably go there then and <laughs> not just shoot in a city park. Because, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of a necessity to find a, a package that was going to be being easy in and out of these places. You, you brought up your Frankenstein stabilizer rig uh, because so much of this film is following the slow, lumbering monster through the forest. Uh, you took a very interesting approach to that rig. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, all the walking shots are a very critical part of the film, and like uh, we were looking at the films of... Whoa. That was me. That was my fault. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, so when we were... Uh, uh, yeah, dressing the films, a kind of national sort of rule book for the film. It was very important to be able to ball this character, have these sort of long, uninterrupted takes going through the remote forest. But on the original block, and like looking into more research and testing, just like traditional rigs weren't working. They're either too big, they were getting caught in the branches and couldn't sort of like navigate through the, the thickness of the, the terrain. And um, yeah, so we, we didn't we didn't want something that felt robotic or too like floaty, like it was a sort of like magical presence that was going through the woods. We always wanted it to feel like it was tethered to the location because we were like making it such a big deal to go out to these locations and the nature is such an important aspect of the story and the environment. So we wanted the audience to always feel like they were connected to that environment. So it was very important for us to find a movement that felt sort of naturalistic and worked with the environment. So after kind of like looking into things and doing some testing, figured out the best way to get around, like sort of trying to navigate these uh, treacherous terrains, and being able to squeeze in and out of stuff was taking um, a more traditional spring arm vest that you would see on like a normal uh, steady cam, putting a, a light cam a stabilizer on top of that and then mounting a RS2 um, gimbal on top of that. And all of them just, it definitely um, took a couple of days to kind of figure out and sort of like uh, smooth out the rough spots. But it gave us this movement that didn't feel robotic like a traditional um, uh, just gimbal on its own can sometimes. And it didn't give us that super swaying feeling that um, uh, sort of like a, a cheaper steady cam can when you're in those locations. And it just kind of gave us something that felt right for the character where it felt like we were with him, but also it still felt a lot in a certain way. Yeah, in our discussion before, you, you brought up a really interesting analogy on the roller coaster. Yeah, yeah it was, um, I, I find this problem with like, um, in a lot of bigger films that uh, 
once stuff gets like too smooth, it becomes almost abstract. Like you, you lose connection with it. There's a, there's a roller coaster um, outside of uh, uh, Toronto, and it's like this. It's amazing roller coaster. It's super smooth, but it's you kind of come off of it being like you don't really know how to describe it because it's so abstract. And it's, you don't really feel the speed. You don't feel connected to anything. But at the same time, they have this old rickety wooden roller coaster that once you get on that thing, like, you feel it. You <laughs> feel like you're on a roller coaster. You feel the speed. You are connected to your surroundings. And it's kind of terrifying, but at the same time, like, it, I don't know, it just makes a big difference for me to, like, be able to feel like that camera is there in that space. Especially now, when, like, so much stuff, and, like, you have um, stuff shooting volumes and everything is just getting, like, too clean and too perfect. So having a like, little bit of imperfections in the movement of the image, just to make things feel alive and natural, was very important to us. I, I got to ask about lenses, because I'm a lens nerd. Um, what, what did you use on this and why? Uh, our primary lenses were an uh, old um, set of uh, Canon FD primes. I just found that the, uh, the quality that they had was, uh, it, it wasn't too vintage, but it also wasn't too clinical like some modern glass can be. And uh, yeah, just using those, it gave us like a sort of slightly impressionistic look that helped with the film, but it also did it. Yeah, it, it just it, it really worked well for the uh, greens that we had and all the nature, and it just it also looked great with Johnny. And they were also uh, small enough and like light enough that we could use them on the package without any sort of uh, issues with uh, weight for the stabilizer and getting things rigged up. Yeah, a really nice, compact, beautiful package. Uh, and some really nice extended depth of field being used in this in dark night situations around the campfire um, with, with a very limited package it's really beautiful work in that oh thank you um yeah one of the things we definitely looked at ahead of time was like we referenced looked at a lot of stuff shot on 16 millimeter so we we definitely love that kind of like deeper depth of field that a lot of 16 millimeter photography just has by nature of the uh, format size and uh, when we were looking into cameras ahead of time, we were looking at some full frame stuff. And full frame just didn't feel right for this project. We wanted like a uh, Super 35 sensor as just like the sweet spot where we get that sort of like good deep depth of build when we're doing that. Because it, it's weird, because we don't really have a lot of scenes with traditional coverage. So we'll have sequences where it's like Johnny's just like a few feet in front of us, but at the same time, like way, way off the distance, something is happening that the audience sees the clock. And so it was very important that finding that uh, depth of field that was deep enough that you know, we, we could still direct the audience's eye to stuff, but at the same time, like, not lose out of the details or the environment. Because we also wanted to feel like the woods itself. It didn't make much sense for us to go out to all these remote locations and just have such shallow depth of field that all we can see is this guy walking in a giant blur. We wanted to see those woods. Yeah. Chris, you've got a, a bit of a background in uh, dabbling with prosthetics and makeup. Um, not giving away any, any spoilers, but um, you do not disappoint in this film with creative murders and uh, incredibly <laughs> violent, awesome sequences. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about your background uh, with prosthetics and sort of the, the way that you approached the violence in this in a violent nature? Uh, yeah, I, uh, as I have a background uh, in prosthetics effects. Um, it's, you know, just growing up being a horror fan, something that I was always interested in, and um, making, like, even just, like, horror shorts on, like, VHS with my parents' camcorder, uh, you know, wanting to do something a little, you know, wanting to show some blood, show some stuff. I just learned from, uh, you know, any, like, Bangori magazine at the time, you know, uh, special features on DVDs were really big, so I was, like, just devouring those, trying to figure out how to do prosthetics. And then, uh, yeah, I just got into the uh, industry, doing a lot of like just my own stuff to begin with, but then um, meeting other directors and prosthetics artists, like a uh, friend, Steve Dostansky. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we both have an approach to shooting prosthetics where, um, you know, being in the industry, being working on TV shows, working on prosthetics, like any kind of gags, you know, you work for weeks on something and then when it comes time to shoot it, you're on set and they're telling you like, yeah, we're gonna get this before lunch. Don't worry, you'll be going home early. And then it's always the last shot push to the day and you have one take and it's never great. 
and then they just go over it with VFX anyway. So uh, we've been, uh, our approach has been all the effects are kind of just a whole other unit of themselves. Anytime we have to incorporate an actor, we'll shoot out like the actor's coverage for it, like with any specific location we need. But uh, afterwards, uh, it's, it's almost like a completely separate unit where we have just a time, we're not under uh, a schedule for our, the actor having to leave, and it just gives us time to like dabble and yeah, perfect I've, things. I've, uh, throughout my career, like I've done a lot of second unit shooting for different films, and like my, sort of up to this point, a lot of my work has been filming practical effects for, uh, for films and um, just like uh, prosthetic effects. And like they are so amazing, I have such huge respect for the talent. But it's it's like any performance, you need time to coax a performance out of like these these effects. You can't just go in and be like, okay, one one take, it does a thing, and then you can just like get cut, right? Like no, you need time to work at the performance. But being able to capture stuff in camera, it just it creates such a, a visceral feeling for the audience that is so important, especially in this type of film. And also because like sometimes you might only have one take because of like, you know, it's a, it's a destructive medium in a lot of cases where you're building something, you're, you're, you know, you're building a sandcastle and then it's like you're waiting for the ocean to come in and just tear it down. So you have one take at it and the prep time of doing it second unit where we're like ironing out every detail, knowing that we've got one shot at this, let's make sure that everything's plugged in. Uh, and yeah, everything's hooked up and we're ready to go. Yeah, when you say you're, you're treating it like a separate unit, it's, it's just the two of you guys. It's, it's, it's all a unit. It's just more concentration. Yeah, it's made. just a little bit more stripped down, so we also don't have, like, actors sitting around waiting if it, we're just filming the scene with, like, a dummy. Like, it's, it's just a little counterintuitive and also like, wraps out a little bit early and stuff like that. Just, just something because, like, we have been in those situations before on other films where it's, like, we're doing something that, you know, takes, like, a few hours to do, and the entire crew is just standing around and just kind of just like, what, what are they doing? So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's not... Sometimes there are a few shots where it literally was just the two of us doing stuff, but for the most time, yeah, it was... it was We still had a crew, but it was more the crew focused around what we would do, as opposed to just, like, the normal crew you would have day-to-day -day for your traditional, like, coverage. Chris, you... you did a really beautiful job of slowly revealing your monster. Um, to see just elements of him over the course of the film. To address that kind of decision and, and the evolution of that, how you held back from uh, Well, we wanted to unveil our like slasher monster man. Uh, his name is Johnny, it's just good American name. Uh, but so <laughs> anytime, uh, Pierce has mentioned Johnny. He's referring to our mom. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to reveal him uh, in stages, slowly, one at a time. Um, so, you know, when he, it, it begins, I'm not spoiling anything, literally the first sequence, him coming out of this, like, shallow grave that he was buried in. Um, but we don't want to show everything. We don't want to, like, give the audience, like, that... Uh, I don't know what the word would be exactly, but... We're, we're spending so much time with this character, looking at this yes. character. It was very important to be able to dole out the details of his physique and figure. Yeah. So it was like... And, and characters are, re are reacting to what he looks like. And we want to be able to just like let them react and not let the audience know what they're reacting to. Uh, so like stage one, him coming out of the grave. Stage two is he finds his like, you know, slasher mask. And then at one point in time, we did want to just reveal everything, but like we wanted to save that. We wanted to save like, okay, what are all these other characters actually looking at? So um, there's only one actual reveal of who he is in the movie. Uh, it's a special time. Uh, <laughs> it's the one moment where um, it's he's slightly humane. Um, but uh, because of that, we just had to make a lot of decisions of like how we're gonna shoot this. A lot of it is following, like third person from behind, um, and then we're focusing in specific moments, like revealing his hands, revealing you know his weapon, or even just um, keeping him in the shadow, keeping him in silhouette. It, it you know, was a fine. It was a fine balance of finding shots where it's just like okay, this would play good as a silhouette because it's really about his form here. Here we need a little bit more detail to kind of 
feel bits of his hands, to feel like the texture of the weapons, to feel like how dirty his clothes are. It was all about just finding the sort of the right textures that, uh, that we could reveal on his character. Yeah, and it also just, when you're doing that, when you're, you know, putting up these restrictions upon yourself, it, I find that it really does create, a, you know, a more significant and impactful image for something more memorable for the audience. You, it's also a really delicate balance of exposition and, and getting us to understand this character and where he comes from without being able to cut to other actors talking about him. So we're getting sort of off-camera dialogue, we're getting people in the distance talking about the legend of this that's uh, very delicately handled. Uh, were you worried about that aspect of it or, or worried about... Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, we do use a lot of uh, tropes that are already established from other slashers. Uh, and that is a tool that we use to communicate information. So like, you kind of are familiar with like, okay, this character is this character, this character is this character. Um, I've seen this before in other movies, but it, we use that as a launching point for us to be able to like, talk or discover more about our actual slasher. So uh, because we're following the slasher the whole time, it's all the stories revealed through background chatter of like situations that he's like walking into before he uh, you know kills some unsuspecting person. So it's like they'll be talking about um, you know their own situation that's going on because there's always like some sort of relationship problem, some sort of like asshole boyfriend or something like that. So we're we're picking up on all of that and then. Uh, at getting that whole story communicated. Um, but uh, so the sound design was actually incredibly important for this film. Uh, but at one point in time, like our, our mixers were amazing. Um, they followed my direction uh, to a fault where I was like, I really want to have the sound be in the perspective of our slasher the entire time. And so, like, you know, everything's coming in at a distance. But that just became. Like, we unknowingly created a white noise machine that <laughs> just, like, it was the first time I watched it where I'm just like, I'm really tired. I, <laughs> I, uh, um, so we, we, you know, played around with that and just, you know, I'll increase the volume to let the audience, like, get some story, be able to attach something to another story. Uh, yeah, just giving everybody something a little more involved. And going back to a second what Ash said about all these characters taking such inspiration from traditional slashers. Uh, that's one of the things like we are very aware of, like so much of the mythos of the film is, uh, you know, tied to these, these classic films that the, the horror community loves so much. So it was also a conscious decision on our part not to have this movie look like those movies and try to have it be its own sort of fresh sort of take. So since we were like borrowing so much of that already, we didn't want to be trying to live whole set out. As, as a former cinematographer, I, I know reading a script how my blood would run cold when I would read Exterior Forest Night. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about um, a limited budget now because you're, you're scrapping down to limited tools and limited crew. How do you handle something like a, a desolate forest in the middle of the night uh, on no money? It, it was really finding just like kind of the bare essentials that we needed for the scene. Um, we had a very small uh, nighttime package. Uh, we had like one 2K Jenny. Yeah, we had one 2K Jenny that was small enough that our crew could kind of like bring out without just kind of completely wrecking them. And for the most part, what we used to light those scenes, um, a lot of the nighttime stuff uh, were uh, just uh, three lights. We had three main lights that we had. We had an Aperture 600, and then we had a two uh, 300Xs. Those are our kind of like our hero lights for the forest locations. It was a lot of just like just trying to make things work. And the C70 was super great for that too because we could push the ISO a bit. We didn't want super clean, like where we're getting a perfect exposure. That we, wanted. we wanted things to fall off into the shadows. We wanted to have a little bit of grit and texture to it. So be able to push the ISO a bit and be able to like shoot the nighttime stuff at uh, like a Two a to a four, on uh, the uh, f stop to just like get still have that little bit of depth of field. Uh, it just it gave us the kind of the vibe that we we're looking for for the nighttime photography. 
Oh, and also um, allowing the uh, sound design to like fill in any gaps that we might be missing just because of our small like package and uh, allowing people to also see what the ears. It's also a very quiet film, so it puts a, it really puts the onus on your sound designers to do that. How did you connect with them? Uh, and what was your relationship with your designer? Oh, uh, we connected with them um, during, uh, well, after I watched the assembly cut of the first time we tried to shoot it. Um, our film has no like score. Uh, we have some diegetic music that plays through it, but, over, but it's not scored. We're just scoring with sound design itself. Um, and that was always the intention going into it. But when I watched the assembly cut, uh, like the first time I tried to shoot, I was very much like, oh, we need a score. This is, <laughs> this is not working. Uh, maybe the score will fix everything. So we uh, got in touch with a um, uh, uh, like ambient artist in Toronto that I've been a fan of uh, for a long time. And uh, he ended up putting us in touch with our sound design team, um, Tim and Michelle who uh, do sound design work for uh, other short films. They work uh, in sound design for Ubisoft. It's their like main gig. And uh, yeah, they just hit it out of the park. They were fully on board. They loved the idea of just letting the design itself shine through the film. And um, yeah, they were uh, vital to like editing success. Yeah, it's always a battle between the sound designer and the composer. Uh, which is why they're not normally allowed the final mix because one or the other is going to get screwed by one of them. Uh, but you really picked a just a beautiful ambiance that you just feel because there isn't any score, so it just feels very casual. Yeah, I, uh, it's been interesting um, doing that and just watching films afterwards and just being like, I like I judge scores so much now as far as like <laughs> this is not necessary. It's, uh, <laughs> we, do, like, we don't need to be assaulted right now. We can just let the image live with itself. Hans Zimmer, you're not in the audience, are you? <laughs> just make it sure. We talked a little bit uh, uh, just about the creatures you've got to deal with uh, that are not part of the set uh, in the forest and uh, some of the uh, indigenous life. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a reason why a lot of people don't like film movies out in a kind of remote uh, northern Ontario. It's because uh, it's, it's, it has its own set of challenges. Yeah, there's, yeah. Uh, the crew is, like, a lot of the crew is from southern Ontario, and they weren't used to uh, just, like, the black fly season yeah. or the mosquito season I mean, our, our original, because we, we did uh, two, we did two uh, small blocks in uh, Sault Ste. Marie. At the first block, we were supposed to be, like, getting out there right before the black fly season started. But, uh, of course, we had, like, a big rainfall. They all, like, woke up a uh, yeah. early. So, uh, yeah, you, you see them in the movie. There are definitely times when I'm, like, shaking the car in front of the lens because they're just have landed on top of the camera and are crawling on the lens because it's like, it's this little black thing that's warm in the forest, so they're all like, just gathering on top of it, uh, eating me in the process as well. Yeah, no, that was, it was fun because like, you know, I was pretty used to it, so everybody else on the crew is just decked out in mosquito nets, and I'm just in a t-shirt covered in blood, and before we were shooting, every time I just look at Pierce and he'd have a it's just frantically waving it in front of the lens, just uh, in front of the lens, just to get an image. Um, but still, some snuck through, and uh, our our sound design team actually it, it became like this serendipitous uh, uh, motif within the sound, where like as when you when it was unavoidable that like there's bugs all over this lens, they would just pump up the sound and turn it and, and like can't really make out what they are, so they just like made it seem like they're flies, and it just became this harbinger of like any time there were flies. Somebody's gonna die. Uh, so it worked out in the end. But but even the actual like our, our the actor that played Johnny uh, themselves, they uh, we had to uh, he wears this giant this big like leather hood that goes completely covers his head uh, right down to the neck and chest. But it impedes walking so much because you you're just completely myopic. You've got no idea about your surroundings and the terrain was very rough. So we had um, uh, multiple masks, and one of the masks was all cut out, so he had plenty of room to move his head around, and he could see everywhere he was going. But that just became this like giant mitten 
for mosquitoes and black flies to just fly in. And just, it was like, it was like a restaurant that they could go in and just eat our main actor. Yeah, it is another horror movie. I'm deeply terrified by that. Uh, so many challenges on this. What, what might have been the biggest challenge for it, it was honestly just figuring out sort of the right balance of how to logistically just do all these sequences. Because, I mean, we don't really, we barely, rarely repeat the same sort of like setups from like sequences, aside from like the recurrent reoccurring that motif of walking. Uh, just every every scene, it's just like, okay, we're, we're sticking with this um, sort of this uh, methodology and sort of that thesis that Nash has created for the film. How do we make that interesting scene by scene? So it was trying to find ways to like, not just fall back on sort of the what we did on a half hour earlier in the film, but to find ways to just keep bringing new life into these, these sequences. And uh, yeah, there's, I also can't choose just one. I think one of the most ambitious scenes that we did was the uh, sequence up on the cliff with the uh, yoga, but that's that's mainly just for the uh, process. What they were able to pull off from that was uh, incredible. So yeah, I, even though that wasn't the most daunting from a cinematography standpoint, still just the fact that we were able to get that sequence, I, 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 I couldn't be happier. And now we know why you're a cinematographer and not a sound. <laughs> Apparently, the mics don't love you. Um, I think, honestly, the biggest challenge. Whoa. It's fine here where to put this microphone. Uh, was uh, sticking with the actual thesis, like sticking with the bit. Because it's, you were, we're drawing a lot of like traditional slasher horror things, but we're presenting it in a very unique way. And it's not an experimental film by any means, but the process was an experiment, and it, it was a rift like, where we're like, this could very, very, very easily not work with all the limitations we're putting on ourselves, um, uh, like as far as stylistic. So just having the confidence to stick with that the entire time and you know, paying tribute to the movies that we grew up on while trying to carve out a new path um, and uh, yeah, just I don't want to say the courage. That's really lame. But <laughs> just having the dedication, I guess, to, to go forward with it and let ourselves fail. If it didn't work. I don't think it's lame at all because it is incredibly courageous to take this approach to to no score to long sequences of just following a character walking. Uh, I, I watched that and was like, oh, this, this director's got some cojones. Like, this, this is, you made some decisions here and stuck with it that would have terrified me. Uh, but it works out in the end and it works out to be, like I said, a very unique take. Yeah, I think, I think, whoa. I think actually, yeah, sticking with it is the only reason that it actually worked. I think uh, because there were, like, formalistically, we were doing something so, so specific. If for even like a moment, we decided to make it a little more traditional and like show our hand, it would have, it would have been a moment of weakness. It, it would have translated and seemed very inauthentic to what we actually did. Yeah, once you start down that path, you can't just suddenly switch to, to conventional coverage in a scene. You stick with it and, and continue with it and create the whole teeth. Yeah, 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 just like let the vibe be the vibe, really. Did your producers try to talk you out of it at all? No, no, no. My producers are angels. Uh, <laughs> they, they, oh, they're uh, obviously here, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, the producing team, um, like, we've known each other for uh, like 20 years, we've been very good friends. So um, they understand my temperament. Uh, they understand that I'm, I can get very, very, very stubborn, um, and that I have like a level, a threshold that I won't let myself go below. Um, not as far, not even necessarily in terms of quality, but in terms of like intention. Um, so yeah, they uh, they were there every step of the way, being like, okay, I guess we're doing this. I guess we're doing this now. 
everything in the film basically had to have like intent behind it. There was nothing we could do that just goes like, oh, this looks cool, or uh, this would be a fun shot to get. Everything had to have like a dedicated intention behind it. Um, yeah, and it also helped that like, I think like so much of the crew uh, were our filmmakers as well as technicians. So like anytime, like everybody uh, was able to like say like pre give ideas to uh, to like how to proceed. Like one of the deaths, uh, for instance, like like the final one, um, all came out like was from our uh, camera technician. He was like just like it would be really funny if this happened, and I was like, yes, that would. Let's let's throw this in. Um, but even like our our. Uh, we had a couple uh, first ADs, but um, they're, they're all filmmakers too, so like being able to like, contribute ideas as far as like, you know, knowing what I was intending, providing opportunities to like more easily uh, succeed in this was like so necessary like, going forward. It's like we, we went into all the scenes had a game plan, but of course the nature of filming is you can go in with all the storyboards, a game plan you want on location, or just on the day, stuff is not going to work. So being able to have like brainstorm and still be able to stick with the bit but rework it on the day was like, yeah, it, it, we, it, it was crucial for the production. At what point does that sort of uh, improvised or, yeah, that's a great idea for your ending death. With what point of production does that come to allow you to scramble to deal with that? Oh, well, I mean, like, that was actually, like, for instance, that was, uh, the, the only reason that this movie really happened, it was, like, it was an idea that I had for quite a while, but, uh, while I was shooting my, uh, our, our friend Steve Kostansky's, uh, doing prosthetics for his, uh, film Psycho Gorman, um, uh, we were all just like chilling out, talking about movies, um, talking about horror films, and just thinking about like, what's a different angle for a slasher? And I said, well, I've always had this angle. And so like, it was literally like all our, all the, the behind the scenes technicians. So like the effects guy, Mike Hamilton, uh, who was on our film was also the effects guy on uh, Psycho Gorman. And so like, as we were just spitballing back and forth, he was just like, this would be funny. So this was actually like, um, even before the script was written, that like ideas like that because yeah we're we're a pretty tight knit group of uh, of filmmakers and creatives and all work on each other's stuff so and continuing that trend on the set of Violent Nature uh, Steve was just we we're all joking around and that's where the concept of his next film came from so the tradition is continuing so I'm sure maybe your next film might come from uh, Steve's he was very likely yeah <laughs> nice I love it I want to be in some of your behind the scenes discussions see if I can get my next film uh, I want to open this up to uh, those of you sitting here listening and see if any of you have any questions for these two. Don't everybody jump at once. Take your time. Uh, but I'm putting you on the hot spot, so I'm staring at all of you to come up with a question. Do it real quick. You're all failing me. Oh, there we go. Yes. So uh, you said you had a tighter group of people shooting. Did like, you, you say how many people and who exactly were to see our team for those shots? I think I'm just gonna look at my producer for a nod. 14, 14 max. So this is, was this cast and crew? Okay, maximum of 14 people, even on our highest amount of cast. Do we wanna acknowledge your crew and, and your production staff here that are with us? No. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, yes, the gentleman back. Can you talk about the process of main unit and then second unit? And how you use that for your success? Um, well, the, uh, as far as like shooting the effects. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, like what I wanted to do earlier as far as like using second unit as almost a um, dedicated effects unit not only like freeing up time and just allowing us to focus on the uh, more gore or aspect of, of the shoot, um, giving us that time to like really concentrate on it. And, you know, we're also, you know, we're making a horror film. And one of the things that we did, like we feel very, very confident in 
our ability to do the effects work. So if everything else failed in the film, at least there would be some fun kills. And we just, yeah. So we did want to really have the dedication of the second unit specifically to that. Yeah, we, we kind of, like I said earlier, we did uh, two main blocks of Suzanne Marie. The first one was trying to wrap out as many of the actors as we could. And then the second one was like, okay, this is basically just like us, um, the our, our killer Johnny, and uh, like sort of filling the pieces for some of these big effect sequences. So it was like we could really just sort of focus in and like do those long walking uh, shots and just all that sort of stuff where we, we didn't have to worry about, you know, having all the actors sort of waiting around. And like, when you think of like the more celebrated like effects for um, films, it's like they all did this. They all like were just like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have like our entire crew and cast here where we're trying to do these very delicate effects. We're like we're gonna specifically dedicate some time to these alone. How long does it take to design and plan out the prosthetics and the effects? Uh, I mean, it's you need to every single one uh so there's one big uh which has been the one like the one big debt that a lot of people have been reacting to uh with yeah i want to talk about it but i'm not good thank you uh it it's, was very very intricate there's a lot of pieces i tried to approach each of the deaths in, in almost like a different style of uh of like horror so like some of them are much more like you know traditional slasher how it would look some of them are very very objective um some of them are taking more from like the giallo style of like focusing in on very specific uh, points in the action to create a just a um, more complete, concise scene. Uh, so the one that was like the most intricate, I think, was the um, uh, we'll just call it the cliff one, uh, the cliff death. But for that, we actually had to um, just cast our actor, do a full body prosthetic of them. And then um, there's different stages in which this character succumbs. So, uh, so we had to have different, uh, we had to like build three different stages of prosthetic, each having their own specific action that needed to be completed with this. Um, and so all of that took, it takes, it takes weeks. We were very, very rushed uh, as far as like trying to get everything done in time. So, but that took, took weeks of 12, 14 hour days with the shot itself. In the first block of shooting in that 60% that you had done, had you done any of the prosthetics already? Uh, yes. Yeah, there were some that were already touched. Um, so, yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Yes. On, as far as that first block of shooting, um, I'm kind of curious, like, I mean, you talked about uh, obviously not using very much of it um, and how some things weren't working. I'm curious what exactly changed from the first block to the second block and why you maybe didn't use, end up utilizing more of that first block. Um, and you know, like what specific things were different between the two that, yeah. Um, well, there were some, like one of the main things was there were specific differences in the costume. Uh, the costume itself, I was just like, I wasn't completely happy with, so we did have to do some redesign on our costume. And at that point in time too, I just wanted a consistent performance. Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that Johnny was like an actual, uh, like, an, uh, like an actor, a performer. Um, so the actor that we, we did eventually cast, uh, Ry Barrett, he's uh, a staple of like the genre community in Toronto. He's been in dozens of films um, and a filmmaker himself. Uh, and je I just wanted to make sure that Johnny stayed who he was the entire film. Yeah, and also touching a bit on that too, it was also just like the film just felt different. We weren't trying to like, it wasn't a situation of like we were just going back and like reshooting because the actor was different. We also just like, it. The, the first block wasn't quite the movie. I, I, think, I don't think anyone, like, it was a mixed blessing, the fact that we had to go back because it wasn't really the movie we wanted to make. So it was a combination of just like the movement, the look was all different. So that's, that's kind of one of the reasons we, we use, we only end up using one of those shots from the original block. Yeah, it's a real feel thing. It's an intangible thing to describe, but like, so 
for instance, uh, you know, after we had our cast and crew screening, we were all hanging out and we are just like, let's just throw on the assembly cut of when we shot that first time. And it's bizarre. It's like, it's almost like watching, you know, Scream 2 when they're watching Stab. And it's all the events that happened in the first screen, but it's not right. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a real, like, just a vibe thing. That's kind of fun. You get to actually do a second draft, which is very, very rare. Um, and there's just a reason for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure your producer can talk about some of the reasons for that. Anybody else? So, forgive me if you've already said this, but um, how long was your original, like, ideal shoot day? Like, how long was it going to originally be? That how long did it end up being? Oh, well, uh, I mean, principal photography was scheduled to be like four weeks, um, and that turned out to be the entire first block. So, um, yeah, just reassessing, I guess, from there. Uh, so, like, we had those four weeks of shooting, and then um, the majority of what we see in the finished film was uh, an additional five weeks. And then some small pickup days after that, we shot um, as... You know, we started shooting in September of uh, 2021, and uh, we didn't finish until just in like the final pickup day, which was one of the final death scenes was December of uh, 2022. Well, so Chris Nass is the Terrence Malick of horror films. Fair enough. That's what somebody said once. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you, Pierce. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. And your film premieres on Monday, right? Yeah. So get out to see it in a violent nature. Thank you. Thank you.